on this Tuesday afternoon. And coming up November 9th is the two-year anniversary that Penn State fired Joe Paterno. Hardly an anniversary, I guess, of any happiness for anyone. I guess except for those numb nuts that were on the board of uh, trustees at Penn State. And joining us from FramingPaterno.com is John Ziegler. John, how are you today? Oh, I'm always good to talk to you, Kevin. Well, it's always my pleasure to have you on the show. It's always uh, informational, and it's always fun. And you've written a great column on your website, FramingPaterno.com. And basically it outlines, after two years, what you have to believe if you want to buy into what ESPN and the national media put forth as a narrative based on the free report. If you believe any of that, then you have to believe the points that you make in this column. Yeah, and it's uh, there are quite a few of them. I mean, I don't know how many yes, there, there are, are, but there, there. I mean, I'm sure there are others that could be added to the rather lengthy list. But I just wanted to do the ones that were most obvious, the ones that you, no one could really argue about if they knew the facts of the case, and the ones that really illustrated the absurdity of this whole thing. And I start the column, uh, which people can find at framingpaterno.com uh, in, in our hot links section there at the top of the web page, by talking about the big lie theory, Kevin, and I'm sure you're very much aware of what that is. And, uh, and you know, this, this is something that the more I've thought about this case, and I've thought about it for most of the last two years, I really think is very apropos for what actually happened here. And it really frustrates me, and almost I'm almost upset at myself, and I don't know if how you feel about this, Kevin, because you've been at the heart of this fight since the beginning. I'm almost upset at myself that, that our side of this thing didn't take the attitude that I take in this column right from the beginning. Because I think a lot of us, I mean, even myself, at the beginning of this, we were, I think, too respectful of the arguments of the other side. I think we should have been disdainful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to disagree with you there, John. I think both you and I were disdainful. I think we were. I thought we made our points passionately and with facts to back them up from the day from day one. Because I remember several times talking to you when we both exchanged uh, this idea of if you believe this crap, here's what you also have to believe. You made a movie about it, a mini movie about it. Right. No. No. And I look. There's no question. We have been disdainful at times. I guess I mean by the our side is just the the larger. Um, you know, Paterno forces, uh, the entire, you know, counter movement, resistance, if you will. I think, yeah. I think a lot of people felt two things. One, they were afraid of being labeled as a pedophile protector. That was a huge deal. I mean, a huge, there was the intimidation factor of the media here played an incredibly important role, especially in the decision by the Board of Trustees of Penn State to fire Penn, to fire Joe Paterno and Graham Spanier for all intents and purposes. But I also think the other thing that allowed our side to, to get lulled into this well, we need to be respectful. We need to, we need to make sure that we're, we're not considered to be crazy or or that we're not you know out of control or we need to be credible. Is the notion that you know I think a lot of people thought that the trials, the trials of of the three former Penn State administrators, were going to be coming around the corner, so to speak, when in fact they still haven't even gotten started yet. Right. And I and I think that that really lulled a lot of people into a false sense of security that the truth would come out in enough time for it to matter. And I also think, Kevin, there was always a fear, not just to being seen as a pedophile protector, but a fear, and I got this from a lot of people who should have been on our side, well, maybe there's something more out there. You know, maybe there's a bombshell. I don't want to walk into a bombshell and be made to look like an idiot. And that's an understandable concern, but I think you and I, being media savvy, knew, especially after the free report, that there was nothing else they were going to no. make up at that point. <clears throat> if you just, but see, I, I have no sympathy for those people, or no empathy, I should say. If you don't do your homework and if you don't read, at, le at the very least, read the free report, then you really have no basis to say anything. And once you read the free report, then you have no fear of looking like a fool for disagreeing with it and, and making and knocking it down into what it is, a pile of rubbish. And you have no reason to think otherwise. Anyone who attacks you or me or anyone who chopped the free report to bits hasn't read it, doesn't know what they're talking about, and ought to resign their membership in the ass-kissing fraternity that's known as the national media. And by the way, John, we're seeing it again now with this Richie Incognito story down in Miami. 
as far as I'm concerned, Incognito is just a, a bubbling moron. He's a, he's a typical football player in many, in many respects. And it's locker room joking banter. It's a little bit idiotic. And yet the people at ESPN want this to be a racially inflamed bigot story that they can run with for days, and that's exactly what they're doing. Well, you know, I, and I, my gut tells me you're right about that um, on the incognito story. I don't know that we have enough information yet to know for certain. But no, of course we about, don't. But that's what's so reminiscent about the Penn State story. No, no, there is, there is, there's no question. There are parallels, no question. But I, I think though that when, in, in a way though, in retrospect, what we were asked to believe this whole big lie theory, what we were asked to believe about the Penn State story, is so utterly ridiculous on its face. I mean, it's far more ridiculous than what we're being asked to believe about incognito. Um, and, and, and by the way, my thought on this, Kevin, has evolved so much since the beginning, because I'm a rational guy. I mean, I even, even as much as I have disdain and distrust of the media, I at least thought that there was a possibility that their narrative was right or that part of the narrative was right. And now I'm now to the point, Kevin, I don't know if you agree with this, I think the entire thing is built on on bull crap. I, I I've, am, I've felt that from the beginning. And if you folks, if you want to look at framingpaterno.com, and you ought to if you're really interested in the truth, the very first example, John, that you cite is this. To accept the media's narrative, which you and I now believe is all bull crap, and I felt this way from the very beginning, you have to believe this, that Joe Paterno contradicted a lifetime of admirable work in order to protect a child molester he didn't like, who didn't like him, and who no longer worked for him. You have to believe that if you believe the media's version of this. And, and just so people don't think we're making that up, because I hear to this, to this day, I just got an email the other day, which was hilarious, um, from someone who, who claimed that uh, Paterno and Sandusky were best friends. From Christine Brennan, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't heard from Christine since the last time. Uh, actually, that's not true. I did exchange one more email with Christine, which you, which is added to the column there about our unbelievable email exchange since the last time you and I spoke about this, which people should check out for themselves at FramingPaterno.com. But, but one of the m- most amazing things when I spoke to Jerry Sandusky in prison for three hours was that even after all that had occurred, the disdain, we're talking a lot about disdain, which is, you know, I have a lot of disdain for a lot of people, but uh, you know, <laughs> as do I. The interview today, but, but um, understandably so, Kevin, but the, uh, you know, the disdain that Sandusky still has to this day for Joe Paterno was palpable when you would think that he would have enormous amounts of sympathy because it was his actions, regardless of his level of guilt, which caused Joe Paterno's entire life's legacy to be destroyed. And, you know, a lot of the, 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 the dozens and dozens of items that I put on this list of things you have to believe deal with Sandusky's guilt. And I'm not, and again, I want to make it very clear. I do still this day believe that Jerry Sandusky can be labeled a pedophile and that he did things very inappropriate and probably illegal. But I am now becoming more and more convinced every day, Kevin, that he never had sexual acts with any of those boys. I don't believe it. And part of the reason why I don't believe it is not just is there so little evidence to support it, but it makes no sense based upon the evidence that we do have. And the things that you have to believe in order to believe that are just unreal. And, 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 and I've gotten to know the, the victim rights movement very well in all of this. I've been attacked by a lot of them unfairly. And what I have found out is, one, they don't know the facts of this case. Number two, they don't care about the facts. That's of this the case. important one. Yeah. And number three, they have created rules for engagement that the media has totally bought into, which makes it impossible for anybody to defend themselves. And how no one else is afraid. I mean, Jerry Sandusky could be the worst human being on the planet. I don't even like him personally, okay? I mean, I I think he's, uh, at, at best, I think he's an egomaniac. I think he's dumb, naive, uh, narcissistic. I don't personally believe he ever had sex with any boys because it doesn't make any sense based upon what we know. But but the re, but the reality is that how nobody is a forget about what 
happened to Joe Paterno for a second? I mean, frankly, every educator in America ought to be scared out of their minds about that. But why is no one afraid the fact that Jerry Sandusky didn't even get a free, a fair trial? I mean, he did not get a fair trial. And that is, I believe, a huge part of the reason why Penn State and Joe Paterno paid the price that they did. If Sandusky had gotten a fair trial, basic due process, I think people would have realized that the entire case is built on a falsehood. And, that, and, and there would not have been this rush to judgment, this craze of emotion that was able well, to overwhelm everything in this case. There's always a craze of emotion when someone's talking about pedophilia and young young kids Understandably being sexually so. molested. And that's where, the, that's where the, uh, the sense of urgency was heightened. And yet, you can't allow the lynch mob mentality to overtake factual issues. And when you look at this case... And I don't know whether Sandusky is guilty, innocent, and it doesn't matter to me because he had his day in court, whether fairly or unfairly. He had a lawyer, and he was judged right. to be guilty. So right. that's our system, okay? I'm going I'm to go with our system on that, whether right. it was unless it was unless I have real evidence that someone was corrupt in the in this entire process. I don't know that yet. Uh, I am looking at, at that very closely, but I don't have anything to hang my hat on. But let's just go beyond that for a moment. Uh, Sandusky's guilt or innocence, and and look at the situation that enveloped Joe Paterno and Penn State. And as you point out in this column on FramingPaterno.com, that not one, not one of these alleged victims came forward until and unless Penn State said, we're going to pay off victims. Oh, well, boy, yeah, and- now they all came running. Well, I started to go running, to be honest with you. I had to catch myself. Well, frankly, Kevin, I, I, you know, I have a lot of regrets in this whole situation. I, I, my biggest regret may be in the way that I've handled all this, is that I wish that you and I had put in, uh, you know, some sort of a claim against Sandusky for Penn State, because uh, I, I guarantee one of us would have we would have gotten uh, money, hitting the jackpot, but and exposed what a fraud that whole situation was. And that's what we should have done. But just, but just, I agree. But just for the just for the for the facts, so people understand what we're talking about here. When Jerry Sandusky was arrested, see, people don't, they don't even understand the beginning of the story. They think, they, they've bought into so many false premises, it's hard to even know where to start. But then one of the false premises is that when Sandusky was arrested, people think, oh my God, there was this avalanche of evidence against him, and that the, you know, the prosecution had this airtight case. Well, no. At the, it, they, people would be stunned to learn that only two of the victims at the time of his arrest claimed any sort of a sexual act and one of those two there was some audio tape of his own lawyer conspiring with investigators to try to trick him into saying that <laughs> uh, now so that leaves one and that was aaron fisher who occurred way after jerry sandusky had retired from penn state and had no <laughs> How does he even blame Penn State? His own words during his book tour were, I don't blame Penn State. And so the, the notion, I mean, the, the, there are only three cases that are the specific cases that have anything to do with Penn State. The 1998 case, the so-called janitor case, and the McQuery case. Isn't it interesting, Kevin, that there is not one complaining witness or victim from any of those three cases that claims a sexual assault. Not one. Not one. I, now, th- th- that people find that mind-blowing, but that's the reality. Well, in the 1998 case, there was no sexual assault. In the 2000 case, there is no victim. In the 2001 McQuarrie episode, the victim says nothing happened. So... <laughs> and well, this just shows you that when the media starts the ball rolling downhill and a powerful entity like ESPN is against you... Right. You will never get a trial that is worthy. You will never probably get representation that was worthy. And I, I do believe Sandusky's lawyer was an imbecile. Uh, <laughs> first of all, anybody who would let him go on live television with Bob Costas is an imbecile. That, that's the, well, that's the uh, worst lawyering I've ever seen in my life. For the record, I think Joe Amendola is a good guy, probably too honest to be defense attorney. He's not dumb. I think he was overwhelmed, and I think his co-counsel was actually work. And I mean this sincerely. I think his co-counsel was effectively working for the other side. Well, that may be uh, true. I don't know that. But I do know this. It was Joe Amendola who allowed Sandusky to come on Costas live on TV with, without knowing 
at all what Bob would ask and certainly not right. knowing what Sandusky would say, and that is Lawyer 101. Uh, but, Never I do that. I understand that, but, but let's just talk about that for just a second. Part of the reason, and I think this happened to Joe Paterno too, part of the reason why these things occurred, which were mistakes obviously in retrospect, but some of the mistakes the Paterno forces made, I think, were because they thought they were dealing with innocent people. And so Joe Amendola thought Jerry was innocent. And so he thought, well, let me have him talk to Costas. And maybe we can get this thing straightened out. Well, then well, he should have talked to Sandusky beforehand about right. what Sandusky might say. Right, but, but, but because if, if I talk to my client and I say, let's say that Bob asks you if you're attracted to young boys, what's, <laughs> what is your answer going to be? Okay. If, if he hesitates and pauses, and that pause seemed like it took 16 minutes, and, and, and doesn't give a very good answer and gives a vague answer, right. I would say you're not speaking to anyone. Right, I get that, and, and obviously, in retrospect, and in the word of this entire case is hindsight, you're 100 percent right. But I actually, and I think this is an important point because not too many people ever mention it, and I'm the only one I've ever heard ever write about it. Uh, but when I heard that Costa's interview, obviously, it was a disaster from a PR standpoint. That was actually the first time I started to wonder. Wait a minute. How in the world could Jerry Sandusky be a serial pedophile, get away with it for 40 years, supposedly, right, and not be able to answer such a simple question over the phone? I mean, that doesn't fit. No, but you know what, John? It doesn't fit. And yet I always leave room for this. It doesn't fit because he's a psychopath. And so if that's the case... That's why it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit with you and me, of course. If you said to Bob Costa said to me, Kevin, are you attracted to little boys? I say, are you nuts? Right. And and yet but, that was not Jerry Sandusky's response. Right. But how does that person who doesn't respond almost over the top to that answer get away with this kind of behavior for 40 well, years. Well, that, of course, is the $64,000 question. But I do believe that Sandusky was found guilty on all these counts because of that one answer on national I television. I agree. But I think there's a chance, a fairly, fairly good chance, that that answer has been misinterpreted. And, that, and, and the great irony it, to it, me... It, that, and, you know, John, it may well have been misinterpreted, but you and I both know... That everyone watching that, everyone hearing that, and hearing it again in court and in front of a jury, they're going to take that as, wow, this guy didn't have a definitive answer. He's guilty. So all of the other evidence or lack thereof goes out the window. It's all well and good. I learned this in law school. It's all well and good to have the evidence and have the evidence in your favor. But if the evidence doesn't matter to the jury, it is of little value. And because of that response... The lack of evidence against Sandusky, which there, and the lack of evidence certainly outweighed any evidence. It doesn't matter because they heard that one answer to one. Kevin, question. I couldn't, as usual, I couldn't agree with you more. But let me just make this one last caveat on this. What really bugs me then is okay, so let's follow the logic, and this is in the column that that you're referring to that I wrote at FramingPaterno.com as well. Okay, let's say that it's logical to convict Jerry Sandusky. Uh, based upon his all too honest answer to Bob Costas, right? I mean, that's the premise that he let it out. Oh, he couldn't. He could not lie to Costas when asked, "Are you attracted to sexually to young boys?" Right. So that's the premise. Okay. So let's follow that. So then, why is it then that we presume that Sandusky is lying about every single other? thing he has said in, in the three and a half hour interview that I've done with him, almost all of which exonerates Penn State completely. But there you go again, thinking that people pay attention. And, and, and I'm telling you, people in this country are so moronic that they don't pay attention. They only pay attention to the one sensational comment that he made on national TV. They can't be bothered, John, with with thinking, well, wait a minute, everything else he said, you know, should be considered truthful if that was a truthful answer. They don't look at it that way. They look at it, you son of a bitch, you're a pedophile, and that answer shows that you are. Screw you and Joe Paterno too. And, and yet the, the, another another point that you make in the article where you talk, and this is the answer that all of these media people always seem to come back to. 
Joe Paterno was the most powerful man at Penn State. He could have done anything. And yet, as I always stopped him in their tracks with, and you do in your column, he was fired. If he was so powerful, how could he have been fired? He was fired over a cell phone. He was not allowed to speak at a news conference where he said, ask me anything you want, and I'll answer it. And they banned him, Penn State, by being they, that board of trustees, the biggest pack of corrupt crooks I've ever come across in my life, banned this man who's so powerful that they silenced him like Nazi Germany would have done. Right. No, and and there, there's no question that that's part of an incredibly important pillar in the false narrative. Uh, you could argue that, well, maybe his power was taken away in those three days that ESPN hammered him. Um, well, if you're that powerful, that power, to, hey, plenty of people hammered Hitler and it didn't didn't hurt his power. <laughs> Well, that, that's true, but but look, I mean, you know, as far as where we go from here, Kevin, you know, this Saturday I'm actually uh, heading from California to State College to do an event with Franco Harris on the anniversary of Joe Paterno's firing. Actually, by the way, Franco last night said, "Make sure that I I tell you to say hello." Uh, yeah, and please, the, the same to him, and I'll, I'll I'll send Dana, his his wonderful wife, an email, and I'm so happy that. The, Franco and Dana and you and, and myself and everybody else are still pounding this because there just isn't uh, any seeming end to it, uh, and it's exhaustive in the sense that this board of trustees and this Rodney Erickson joker continues in this vein of mea culpa, mea culpa, we did everything wrong. Penn State did nothing wrong. Well, that, and that's where I'm headed with this. You know, we felt it was important to have this event in State College, and I, I know you have a lot of listeners who are uh, from that area and, uh, and Penn State supporters, and I hope they'll join us. It's a free event Saturday evening in State College, and and um, you know we're, we're going to have a bunch of brand new presentations about the, what the real truth of this matter is. But I agree with you that it's actually, in some ways, getting worse. I know a lot of people have gotten tired of it. They've moved on. They've they realize that this is an impossible fight. I get all that. Believe me, I'm well aware of it. I, I my my life has been <laughs> very much negatively impacted, if not destroyed, by this entire uh, fight. But you but couldn't do... sleep with yourself, as I couldn't, if we didn't keep hitting it when we have a chance. Well, yeah, uh, that's been part of it. I mean, I, I got to tell you, this case has haunted me um, personally. Well, I think what they've done to Joe Paterno in this, John, and I agree with you, it is haunting. Because to do this to a man means there was, there was an old movie called Walking Tall, the story of Buford Pusser, the sheriff down in Tennessee. And these thugs beat him, cut him to pieces, and he went in, he went on in to testify against them. And he stood up and he took his shirt off and he said to the jury, if you allow them to do this to me, you'll allow them to do the very same thing to each and every one of you. And it's the same thing here with Joe Paterno. If we allow people like Louis Free and the ESPN morons and the Christine Brennan moronic factor to continue to do things like this to Joe Paterno, imagine what they do to you or me. And I, I've never understood why more people didn't get that because, you know, we are all selfish uh, and I guess most of us just couldn't put ourselves into that position or, or imagine it that way. Um, and it's and it goes beyond just Joe Paterno, but I, I obviously he's the person who I think got railroaded the most, got the, the the most raw deal. I think he has the least amount of guilt on his hands. In fact, I the, the great irony of this whole thing, and I've said this many times before, Kevin. I think you'll probably agree. The two, the two people in all this, who other than Sandusky, who have gotten the most vilification in the news media, were Joe Paterno and Franco Harris. And I actually think that when I evaluate everybody's behavior, that they probably deserve the most praise for how they handled this whole thing. Yeah, and what a high-character guy Franco Harris is. Like you, like me to some degree, he doesn't need this. You know, Franco Harris's reputation was stellar and still is, in fact, in my opinion, enhanced. And... <clears throat> He didn't need to do this. It just shows you what a person of morals and ethical character will do when you choose to stand up. Graham Spanier, how in the world does anyone come after Graham Spanier, who was the president of Penn State at the time, who was a child abuse victim himself? And I'm sure the ESPN nitwits and Louis Free weren't aware of that before they went after him. Right. Now they look like a bunch of jackasses. And this is a man who for no apparent reason would have conducted a criminal cover-up to protect, right. as you point out, to protect an ex-employee that no one liked? 
Graham right. Spanier and I have exchanged emails. He is going to come on the show as soon as his his uh, trial is over. I wish they'd get to that because I want to I want to have Graham on and talk with him. This is an accomplished man who, and, and of course, accomplished men fail all the time. We know that, but not this guy. I'm sorry. Well, it, a child course, abuse victim is not going to cover up a child molester. It just it just doesn't wash. And normally, a guy like Graham Spanier, who's a card-carrying liberal, he actually you know works within the Obama administration with a high security clearance. Uh, now we can be, talk about that. <laughs> which would be considered, which would be considered normally, right? The media normally would give you. Uh, well, know, they'd love him for that. As many passes as you want. Um, I am positive that Graham Span- Spanier is innocent in all this, mainly because there's no logical scenario where he isn't. And I have told Graham Spanier. And he has agreed with me that uh, they need to, if that trial ever occurs, they need to challenge the prosecution and say, okay, you believe this is a cover-up. Tell us how it happened. Who started it? And why has anybody flipped on that person? Because it's, there is no scenario, Kevin, that makes a damn bit of sense in, in this cover-up, no, in its implementation, or in its philosophical plan. Here's the easy one. Here, this is so simple that it knocks you down. And yet, of course, the dopes at ESPN and the national media people don't get it. If there was a cover-up, you're involving Graham Spanier, the president, you're involving the athletic director, Tim Curley, and you're involving Schultz, the head of the police department on uh, the state college campus. Right? All three of them are involved, and Joe Paterno's involved. That's the allegation. So if there was a cover-up, these guys are involved, one of them's dead. Wouldn't it be logical? I'll tell you what would happen if I'm them. They would all blame Joe. You're damn right they'd all blame Joe Paterno. Every single one of them would say, that was the guy who put us up to this, and he was so powerful, he was the most powerful man on campus. We're innocent. Joe Paterno did all this. And not one of them has said one word negatively toward Joe Paterno. And, and, And in fact, what I find hilarious is that Frank Fina, the Sandusky prosecutor, says on CBS, although CBS did their best to spike it, that Joe Paterno was not involved in a cover-up. CBS Um, must have had a heart attack when he said that. Oh, no, no, don't say that. We can't edit that out. But but wait a minute. Here's the best part of it, Kevin, and and maybe I've even been lax about making this particular point because people will misinterpret it and say that I'm claiming Paterno was involved in a cover-up. But how does that make any sense? So, so Fina believes that Spanier, Curley, and Schultz went around Joe Paterno, the most powerful, powerful man, man on in campus. State college, <laughs> and and decided to have a cover up without him. Yeah. How, how, how does that work? Despite him, right? You know, I mean, they, uh, over his objections, apparently. Right. I mean, so it's absurd. I mean, and, and by the way, let's not forget Mike McQuarrie, the only witness in this uh, cover up, is not involved in the cover up because he's not even claiming that in his lawsuit against Penn State. So even though that would be worth millions of dollars, and the media would be cheerleading for him, I mean, it's completely and utterly ridiculous. No one wants to pick an actual lane to go to to tell us what they think really happened because they can't they can't tell a story that makes any sense i've tried to tell a story that makes perfect sense in my book the betrayal of joe paterno which is free at framingpaterno.com we've released another version an updated edited version of the mini movie the framing of joe paterno which is also free at framingpaterno.com uh, we're doing this event this weekend and i just want to make one of the last point kevin i don't know how much more time you have but you know as far as those who have stood up I'm I'm really ticked off at a lot of people who did not stand up, who should have, who should have known better. People in the news media, uh, people like Todd Blackledge, who did the national Penn State game against Ohio State, who I've spoken to numerous times, who knows this story is a is a bunch of bull crap, and who said nothing on that broadcast, not one word. He had a national television audience in that opportunity. He did nothing. LeVar Arrington has done nothing. He's a media person from Penn State. Uh, Jack Ham, uh, who um, uh, you know played at Penn State for Joe Paterno and with Frank O'Harris, uh, is, does the Penn State broadcast. He's done nothing. Matt Millen is a complete puss uh, on ESPN, giving them everything that they wanted during this entire saga. I, it just really, the cowardice, I've never seen such cowardice well, in this story. Let me show really you where that me. comes from.
I've been, I've been in broadcasting for a long time. Broadcasting people and the people on the air gutless. are the biggest cowards and gutless human beings I've ever come across in my life. And if it means their little job of broadcasting a game or a show, they'll kill their mother so right. that they can keep their little job and float their egos out there. I personally don't care. I've been fired many times, and proudly so, because I stood up for the right things. But these cowards, Matt Millen's the biggest joke that ever walked the earth. He sits there on ESPN and starts crying when this right. took place two years ago and then does nothing to exonerate Joe Paterno, who really does, does not need any exoneration. The and facts the way, just, speak just, for just, themselves. Just, just, just to remind people, Matt Millen was on the board of the second mile. Yeah, he and Jerry Sandusky. Right. <laughs> you know, and your your last point in your column is I, John Ziegler, must. This is what people have to believe if you believe the media narrative. I, John Ziegler, and he might as well throw Kevin Slayton in there. Right. Must, must either be one of the dumbest people in the world, or at the very least, have a death wish for my career in economic security. <laughs> Well, that's all too true. Um, yes, it is. But, yes, but it I, is. I just wish somebody would actually say that because that's what you have to believe. You have to believe that. I will what? never, as long as I live, I'll never forget the picture of you on CNN with that incredible puss, Pierce Morgan, who ought to just be banned from this country uh, because he is he is a traitor to anything that this country stands for. Well, well and, 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 and your, your bewildered look when this moron can't understand the very basics of this case. Right. Didn't understand the difference between Jerry Sandusky and Joe Paterno. It's unbelievable un- that right. this guy has a job in the media. It's, un- but it's but unconscionable. Would, but but to, your, to your larger point, I do wish, I wish so many things about this case, but I do wish someone would explain, why would Kevin Slayton, a radio talk show host in St. Louis, and John Ziegler, a guy who lives in California, with no con- neither of us with any connection to Penn State. I went to Georgetown. I mean, we, 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 neither of us knew Joe Paterno. We, I, I mean, the, I can't stand Scott Paterno and vice versa. <laughs> why, why in the world are we doing this? Why? Yeah. Could someone explain why we're doing this? Yeah. If, if it's not about the truth, if we're not on to something, yeah. and why are we? And why won't anyone debate us? That's the other question I'd like to have answered. Yeah. If we're so wrong, why won't anyone take the opportunity to humiliate us? Why wouldn't Mark Emmert, the head of the NCAA and his band of little Indians, go on with Bob Costas with an open invitation to come on? Rodney Erickson with an open invitation to come on Bob Costas' show for an hour when he had um, – uh, Dick Thornburg on, the former attorney general right. who authored the Thornburg report, basically uh, disputing the free report. Why wouldn't they go on? Bob Costas is not going to beat him up over the head. Right. But he is right. going to ask him serious questions, and they don't want serious questions, John. So they sure as hell, if they don't want to debate Bob, they don't want to debate you or me. You know what? I should add that to my list of things you have to believe. I forgot about the ducking of Bob Costas by Louis Free and Mark Emmert. That there, there's no question that belongs. And by the way, uh, along ducking Bob Costas, how about you know there's Rodney Erickson running away from me? Uh, literally, we have that on tape. Uh, you can see it at FramingPaterno.com. And there's Mark Emmert literally running away from me and Franco Harris, which you can uh, hear and and get the uh, you know the the actual confrontation between Franco and Mark Emmert, which is classic. Yeah, and. and, uh, and, and, and if you're so sure of your position that Penn State is so evil and that they are so guilty in this case, Emmert should be all too willing, and Louis Free, that coward, should be all too willing to go on with Bob Costas and explain their position. But they won't. So the question that needs to be asked is why? Well, the reason, as you know, is because they, they're afraid they're going to be exposed. Bingo! And but but will will that ever find its way onto Sports Center? Of course no, not. No, and, and 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 I'm you know I'm curious. You know, obviously, you know Bob Costas very well, and you're a big part of the reason why Bob revisited this and and seemingly has changed a good portion of his theory about what really happened here. Why would Bob Costas bother? To do that, right. if it wasn't true. I mean, right. why would he? Why in the world why would, would he Bob care? Costas take that kind of risk? I mean, you know him. Why would he do that? He wouldn't. I can promise you that. I know Bob well enough to know he wouldn't. And and to Bob's everlasting credit, he was given a narrative as he landed in London for the Olympics from a producer from the Today Show, and had to. And they wanted a comment based on the information he was given, and that's what started, unfortunately. Uh, him on that wrong road, but but to his credit forever, 
he right. he looked at this story from the reality of the free report when he had a chance to read it, and immediately look. Bob Costas is a sharp guy. He immediately knew that the free report was full of holes, as anyone with a reasonable mind would conclude after actually reading it. This whole thing is the biggest perfect storm of, of perfect storms I've seen. I mean, and that's actually another great example of it. One of the very few guys with the gravitas and the power to change the narrative happened to be on a plane going to the Olympics uh, and got you know and commented based upon bad information. And he he could have done a lot more at that be, at that first stage when the narrative hadn't quite been set yet. Another perfect example of that is Brent Musburger. He buys into what Jeremy Schapp lies about before Free even holds his press conference. Musburger is not only a big name, but a, a friend of Joe Paterno's, and he throws Paterno under the bus before later uh, you know, basically backtracking and say, well, wait a minute, Joe, Joe probably got a raw deal here. But How about then, Phil Knight at Nike? Yeah. <clears throat> that scumbag. Who, sh- who shows up at Joe Paterno's memorial and then rips him, and then, of course, does another about-face. He's, he switched colors about 15 times in this deal. That's a good example. My understanding is that Phil Knight, of course, this doesn't excuse him because it's, it's basically the same thing as all these gutless media types worried about their jobs. But my understanding is that he had no choice in the matter because of Nike shareholders. Um, and, and that he well, then, then, have, then have a set and stand up to your shareholders. Do the right well, thing. Look, if I had that kind of money, I think you know, I think my balls would be pretty pretty well yeah. positioned. If, 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 if I'm Phil Knight, nobody's scaring me. Exactly. I got news for you. Absolutely nobody. And you know, the the interesting thing for me is Bob Costas spoke to the folks at ESPN. He's he, Bob's got great connections and suggested that this is a perfect subject for thirty thirty. Ah. Thirty for thirty. Suggested that to ESPN. What did they do with it? Nothing. Of course. Nothing. It's a perfect subject for that. Well, you can't. They can't do it as a thirty for thirty because you'd have to rip ESPN. Yeah, I mean, they, you'd have to actually I mean, tell the truth. Right. I mean, yeah. If you told the truth, at the at the very least, you would leave ESPN's own narrative in tatters. Um, you know, and and the reality is, you know, thirty for thirties are great, but they they don't take risks. I mean, none of them none of them are going to go after ESPN taking cows. <laughs> they're, and, they're, they're not going after, not ESPN. Go after ESPN. Well. Uh, when is the uh, is this Saturday? That yep, this Saturday, the the, the anniversary, second anniversary of Joe Paterno's firing. We're going to be in State College. You can find out uh, more information. You know, just if you want to email me at uh, framingpaterno.com, happy to give you anybody who's in, in the area all the information. It's free. It's informative. It's entertaining. Uh, you'll get to meet Franco Harris, and if you care, you'll also get to meet me. So, John, I, I also believe. Before I let you go, I believe that Emmert, the coward that he is, is all of a sudden going to now back away from these harsh sanctions against the Penn State football program. And I believe by this time next year, Penn State will be bowl eligible. Watch and see if I'm not right. That's possible. I, my gut tells me they're going to use that as leverage to try to get the Paternos to, to give up the suit. Um, I think they're trying to position this in a way that's going to try to put a lot of political pressure on the Paterno family and those plaintiffs. Uh, to to say, look, hey, we thought did you cared about Penn State? You know, here you you're going to prevent Penn State from going to a bowl game this year if you stay if you stick with this, well, and hope that that will force the Paterno family hand. I have no idea. If, if, not, if, if I'm the Paterno not. family's attorney, the moment that is brought up in an, any negotiations to settle, I hold a news conference, and I let everybody know that the NCA is now using as their trump card holding bowl eligibility over Penn State over my head to cancel a lawsuit against them. And I'd let the entire free world and most of those people in Iraq know. Yeah, and I I, I think that's possible. Unfortunately, uh, you know, the media you, you, is not going to give the Paterno family any benefit of the doubt here. I mean, I, I don't know that they have a lot of leverage uh, with the news media. And, you know, they certainly have leverage with their supporters within the Penn State community. But I'm, I don't know... I don't know how that's all going to play out. I really don't. I mean, I, I mean, look, I am confident that eventually uh, the winds will be restored and most of the sanctions will be um, reversed. I just don't know exactly how and when under what circumstances. But it will happen eventually. I agree with you there. And if any of them have ever debate you or me, it, wouldn't that be fun? Oh, that will never happen. No, it will never happen. I, I've offered $10,000 to charity so many times my, my wife's had a coronary. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I keep telling her, you don't need to worry because no, nobody no will accept it. Up, That's no right. No one's going to take me up on you, it. You might as well offer a million. 
Because <laughs> nobody's well, ever going to take you up on it. I used 10000 because that's the, that's the amount that Mitt Romney got ripped for uh, betting during a Republican debate uh, during the <laughs> last right. election. That's so right. I figured that, that's the right amount to get the right reaction. <laughs> hey, John, thanks again. Wonderful stuff. And this, this Saturday at State College, folks, if you're in that area, please end up there. Franco Harris will be there and uh, John Ziegler. And uh, the truth is still our fight, and eventually it will come out, hopefully in these trials. Thanks so much for all your time and support, Kevin. Appreciate it. Thanks, John. Same to you. All right, we've got to take a break and get caught up because I'm way behind, as happens when John and I get talking. Can you imagine us at a bar? <laughs> all right, we'll be back with more right here on Talk S- 